Good evening and thank you for coming everyone. My name is Margaret Simons. I'm the head of the journalism program at Swinburne University of Technology and also chair of the Public Interest Journalism Foundation at Swinburne, which in partnership with the Melbourne Writers' Festival is conducting the New News Conference for which this is our keynote address. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce a man who has been in the forefront of thinking about what journalists do and what they should do for a fair uh, degree of my career. Um, I first heard of Jay Rosen in the mid-1990s when I was teaching a journalism course at the University of Western Sydney. And on the reading list of the course, which I hadn't designed, um, there was an article by Jay Rosen which was about public journalism. And I found that term a little confusing. I mean, obviously journalism is public. How could it not be? But as I read the article on a, on a cold train on its way up to the Blue Mountains, I read about a kind of journalism which is not only about being public, but actually about creating a public, which is about addressing the audience not only as consumers, or not at all as consumers, but primarily and most urgently as citizens. That's what Jay Rosen has been on about for most of his career. He's written on media for just about every publication in the United States. He advises a number of the most innovative news publications in the States, and he teaches journalism at New York University. Um, he was the founder of what's often called the public or civic journalism movement in the United States. Um, that, I think, has probably been overtaken or perhaps made more real by technological innovation in the new media age. Um, now, it's my great pleasure to introduce Jay Rosen to deliver the keynote address. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Margaret. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, big thanks to the Public Interest Journalism Foundation and the Melbourne Writers Festival for, for bringing me to Australia. This is uh, an amazing venue. I've never spoken any place like this. Um, but you will not intimidate me. <laughs> when they tell you to uh, turn your cell phones off, they should also tell you to switch your minds on, because uh, you're going to need that um, for this speech. This talk um, tries to do something that I think writers um, have to do, and that is to take things that are very, very familiar to us and make them seem strange. So that's part of what I'm going to try to do tonight as I talk to you about why political coverage uh, is broken. Also, um, the talk I have for you tonight is a result of my encounter with a particular book, uh, and that is Lindsay Tanner's book, Sideshow, uh, which is about what's wrong with the press and political systems in um, Australia. And it was recommended to me uh, by the organizers of, of this event, and I read it, and much of it resonated with my experience as an observer of uh, politics and journalism in the United States. Okay, so here's my talk. This speech had its origins in my appearance about a year ago on ABC's Late Line with Lee Sales. We were discussing election coverage that looks at the campaign as a kind of sporting event. Every day, journalists can ask who's ahead and what's the strategy for winning. This perspective appeals to political reporters, I said, because it puts them on the inside, looking at the campaign the way the operatives do. I then mentioned ABC's Sunday morning program, The Insiders, and I asked Lee Sales if it was true that the insiders were on that program, the journalists. That is right she said. I said, that's remarkable, isn't it? And she changed the subject. <laughs> and let me add right away that Lee Sales is one of the most intelligent journalists and one of the best interviewers I've ever had the pleasure to meet. So this is my theme tonight. How did we get to the point where it seems entirely natural for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to describe political journalists appearing on its air as 
the insiders. Don't you think that's a little strange? I do. Promoting journalists as insiders in front of the outsiders, that is to us, the viewers, the electorate, is a clue to what's broken about political coverage in the US and Australia. Here's the way I would summarize it. Things are out of alignment. Journalists are identifying with the wrong people. Therefore, the kind of work they are doing is not as useful as we need it to be. Part of the problem was identified by Lindsay Tanner in his book, Sideshow, Dumbing Down Democracy. He points out how often the Australian press reframes politics as entertainment, seizing on trivial episodes that amuse or titillate and then blowing them up until they start to seem important. I'm not gonna dwell on this because Tanner has it well covered. So did my mentor in graduate school, Neil Postman, in his 1985 classic, Amusing Ourselves to Death. From a TV programmer's point of view, the advantage of politics as entertainment is that the main characters, the politicians themselves, work for free. The media doesn't have to pay these main characters because the taxpayers do it. The sets are provided by the government, the plots by the party leaders, backbenchers, and spin doctors. Politics as problem solving or consensus building would be more expensive to cover. Politics as entertainment is simply a low cost alternative. Tanner points out how the term yarn is often used by journalists here to describe the sort of stories they love to cover, as in, what's your problem, mate? It's a good yarn. A yarn used to refer to stories that were semi-fictionalized to make them more entertaining. That echo is still there, but Australian journalists don't seem to realize that when they use the term yarn to describe their work. Politics presented as entertainment charges the press with a failure to treat the serious stuff seriously, and that is a valid critique. But here is an even trickier problem. Even when the press is trying to be serious, to provide, say, analysis instead of a good yarn, it increasingly relies on an impoverished notion of politics, a cluster of bad ideas that together form the common sense of the craft in the United States and in Australia. I was here during the election campaign last year and saw enough to see strong similarities between my country's press and yours on most of the points I will raise. But if I get something wrong, if I overdraw the comparison, I'm sure someone will tell me during the question period. I'm gonna concentrate on three impoverished and interrelated ideas that I say have too much influence in political coverage. Then I will present a few alternatives that might improve the situation. And I forgot to mention, if you have a smartphone, you can follow along with this speech at my blog, pressthink.org, because I just published it there about five minutes ago. So, the three impoverished ideas that I wanna describe for you are, first, politics as an inside game, Secondly, the cult of savviness. And third, the production of innocence. Politics as an inside game. The first idea we could do without is the one that I presented to Lee Sales. When journalists define politics as a game played by the insiders, their job description becomes find out what the insiders are doing to win the game reveal those tactics to the public because then the public can, well, this is where it gets dodgy. As my friend Todd Gitlin once wrote, news coverage that treats politics as, in, as an insider's game invites the public be, to become cognoscenti of their own bamboozlement, which is strange, don't you think so? 
or it lavishes attention on media performances because the insiders are supposed to be good at that, manipulating the media. Here's a simple example from an article a few days ago in The Australian. There was nothing especially obnoxious or um, outrageous about this piece. I, I picked it because it was typical in representing politics as an inside game. The headline was, Labor looks at conscience vote to defuse same-sex marriage split. It told us how insiders in the Labor Party were afraid that a divisive debate on same-sex marriage would, quote unquote, dominate media coverage of the December party conference, creating the impression that the Greens are dictating the agenda. Quote, the last thing we need is for the big story of our conference being about same-sex marriage, a senior party source told the Australian. We need it to be about a mainstream issue, a labor issue, not an issue that it looks like Bob Brown thrust upon us. So, do you see what I mean? The insiders here are worried about how their conference is going to play in the media. They are trying to make the story come out a certain way. Reporters grant them anonymity so these struggles can be publicized. But if today's media report about politics is about how the media will be reporting a political event tomorrow, there's obviously something circular in that. And this is how it begins to make a crazy kind of sense to call the journalists insiders. Everyone is engaged in the production of media narratives. Journalists and politicians are both inside the story-making machinery. Now I'm going to teach you a little press critic's trick. One way to detect the dominant ideas at play in any familiar form of journalism is to ask yourself how that form positions the users. Politics as a game played by the insiders positions us as connoisseurs of our own bamboozlement. Or alternatively, we can feel like insiders ourselves. Which brings me to the second idea that we could do without, the cult of savviness. In the United States, most of the people who report on politics aren't trying to advance an ideology but I think they have an ideology, a belief system that holds their world together and tells them what to report about. It's not left or right or center, really. It's trickier than that. The name I've given to the ideology of our political press is savviness, and I see it in Australia too. When you watch political journalists on a roundtable program summing up the week and looking ahead, what they are usually performing for us is their savviness. So let me explain what I mean by that term. In politics, our journalists believe, it is better to be savvy than it is to be honest or correct on the facts. It's better to be savvy than it is to be just, good, fair, decent, strictly lawful, civilized, sincere, thoughtful, or humane. Savviness is what journalists admire in others. Savvy is what they themselves wish to be. And to be unsavvy is far worse than being wrong. Savviness is that quality of being shrewd, practical, hyper-informed, perceptive, ironic, with it, and unsentimental in all things political. And what is the truest mark of savviness? Winning, of course, and knowing who the winners are. To the people inside it, savviness is not a cult. It's not a professional church or a belief system. They would probably reject my terms. But they would say that journalists need to be savvy observers because in politics, the unsavvy are hapless, clueless, deluded, clownish, or in some cases, extreme. The unsavvy get run over easily. They get disappointed needlessly. They get angry fruitlessly 
because they don't know how things really work inside politics. Prohibited from joining in political struggles dedicated to observing what is, regardless of whether it ought to be, the savvy believe that these disciplines afford them a special view of the arena, cured of excess sentiment, useless passion, ideological certitude, and other defects of vision that players in the system routinely exhibit. Therefore, the savvy don't say, I have a better argument than you. They say, I am closer to reality than you, especially if you are active in politics yourself. Now, in order for this belief system to operate effectively, it has to continually position the journalist and his observations, not as right where others are wrong, or virtuous where others are corrupt, or visionary where others are short-sighted, but as practical, hard-headed, unsentimental, and shrewd where others are didactic, ideological, and dreamy. This is part of what's so insidious about press savviness. It tries to hog realism to itself. But even more insidious is the positioning effect. Remember what I taught you. To understand the ideas in play, ask how a given form of journalism positions us, the users of it. What's so weird about savviness is that it tries to position us as insiders invited to speculate along with journalists and other players on how the mass public will react to the latest maneuverings. But the public is us. We are the public. Am I right? But we're also the customers for the savviness product. So don't you see how that strange that is? Take the most generic savviness question there is. One journalist asks another, how will this play with the voters? Listening to that, how will this play with the voters? Haven't you ever wanted to shout at your television set, hey, buddy, or excuse me, hey, mate, I'm a voter. Don't talk about me like I'm not in the room when I'm sitting right here watching you. How will this play with the voters? That's what's so odd about savviness as a political style performed for the public. It tries to split the attentive public off from the rest of the electorate and get us to join up with the insider. Under its gaze, other people become objects of political technique. Savviness is an attack on solidarity. In campaign coverage, for example, nothing is more common than a good lesson in candidate strategy. How Mitt Romney plans to capture the nomination by skipping the Iowa caucuses, or Julia Gilliard, Gilliard's plan for taking Sydney's western suburb, the crucial battleground. That's the sort of thing that fascinates the pros, the insiders. But think about it for a moment. Should we give our votes to the candidate with the best strategy for capturing our votes? Something is off there, or as I said earlier, circular, misaligned. A third idea we could do without helps explain why the first two, politics as a strategic game and the cult of savviness, are so common in the political press. So I call this the production of innocence. This isn't preached about in journalism school or discussed much in newsrooms, and it forms no conscious part of the journalist's self-image, but it's real, a major factor in the news we get about politics. By the production of innocence, I mean ways of reporting the news that try to advertise or prove to us that the press is neutral in its descriptions, a nonpartisan presenter of facts, a non-factor and non-actor in events. Innocence means reporters are mere recorders, 
without stake or interest in the matter at hand. They aren't responsible for what happens, only for telling you about it. When you hear, don't shoot the messenger, you are hearing a journalist declare his or her innocence. This basic message, we're innocent because we're uninvolved, isn't something that can be stated once in a professional code of conduct or an about page. It has to be said many times a day in the course of writing and reporting the news. The genre of it's known as he said, she said journalism is perhaps the most familiar example. But so is horse race journalism, in which the master narrative for covering an election is who's ahead. Journalists will tend to favor descriptions of political life that are A, true, in that verifiable facts support the story, and B, convenient for the continuous production of their own innocence. One of the great attractions to horse race journalism is that it permits reporters and pundits to play up their detachment. Focusing on the race advertises the innocence of the press because who's gonna win is not an ideological question. By asking it, you reaffirm that yours is not an ideological profession. This is experienced as pleasure by a lot of mainstream journalists. Innocence is bliss. The quest for innocence in political journalism means the desire to be manifestly agendaless and thus prove in the way you describe things that journalism is not an ideological trade. But this can get in the way of describing things. He said, she said, journalism doesn't tell us who's distorting the picture more. It's neutral on where reality is. But reality is not something journalists can afford to be neutral about. Political journalism should help us get our bearings in a world of confusing claims and counterclaims. But instead of that, we have savviness, the dialect of insiders bringing us into their games. Nothing is more characteristic of the savvy style than statements like, in politics, perception is reality. Do you ever hear somebody on your television set say that? Perception is reality. Doesn't that make you mad? Whenever I hear it, I want to interrupt and say, no, no, you, you have it wrong. In politics, perception isn't reality. Reality is reality. But then I stop myself from saying that because I realize I sound like a lunatic. I want to read you a famous passage from American journalist Ron Suskind's account of the Bush White House in 2004. The article was called Beyond a Doubt, and it told of a quote unquote retreat from empiricism in the Bush White House. You'll probably recognize parts of this quote. So here's Ron Suskind, uh, a Washington reporter who had a lot of sources within the Bush government. Quote, in the summer of 2002, after I had written an article in Esquire that the White House didn't like about Bush's former communications director, Karen Hughes, I had a meeting with a senior advisor to Bush. He expressed the White House's displeasure, and then he told me something that at the time I didn't fully comprehend, but which I now believe gets to the very heart of the Bush presidency. The aide said that guys like me were in what he, the aide said that guys like me were in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe that solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I nodded and murmured something about enlightenment principles and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world works anymore, he continued. We are an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study too, 
and that's how things will sort out. We are history's actors, and you, all of you, will be left to just study what we do. This is a Bush advisor to a journalist in 2002. Uh, I had a chance to meet Ron Susskind once, to look into his eyes and judge for myself whether this chilling story was something that actually happened or just a good yarn. And I think it actually happened. And we can see the evidence in our politics. The leading contender for the Republican nomination for president, Rick Perry, is emerging as a climate change denialist. We might call this pattern verification in reverse. Verification, the normal kind, which is crucial to journalism, means nailing down assertions with verifiable facts. Verification in reverse is taking established facts and manufacturing doubt about them, which creates political friction and the friction then becomes a source of energy that you can use to run your campaign. This is a political technique. Now, how should political journalists stand toward this technique? As savvy insiders who know how the game is played and need to maintain their innocence? If they do that, and verification in reverse grows and develops and succeeds and becomes a norm, it will be the equivalent of running the press over with a truck. Journalism will become superfluous. When we act, we create our own reality, which is what the Bush advisor told journalist Ron Susskind. Wasn't so much a boast as a taunt. It was an operative telling a journalist, you don't count. We can create our own reality and you guys can't stop us. Now, looking into your eyes, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, yes, Jay, but what do we do about all of this? Do you have a better idea? And I do. But I have to admit, it's only an idea. A thousand things stand in its way. A savvy would tell me this is not practical. So let's call it a thought experiment. You're gonna have to use your mind, you're gonna have to visualize it. Its purpose is just to loosen up our imaginations and point the way to something better. So imagine the entirety of the political reporting and commentary produced by the New York Times or by the political staff of the ABC and plot it on a grid. So I want you to imagine this grid. On the left side of the page, appearances. On the right side, realities. On the top, arguments. On the bottom, Appearances, realities, arguments, and facts. All political news should be divided into these categories, and journalists should organize their daily report into these four quadrants. Under appearances, we find everything that is just that, the attempt to make things appear a certain way. Therefore, under appearances, we find all media stunts, everything that fits under the management of impressions, politics as entertainment, the photo ops, the press releases issued in lieu of actually doing something. Lindsay Tanner's book is full of examples from the day-to-day -day life of a minister in government. For example, he describes going to a town in Australia, I think it was Town Hall, Australia, repeatedly um, because it was important to uh, 
to the party. And he met with no local officials. He went to no local meetings. He didn't uh, interact with any local labor people. He didn't visit any local sites. He was just there to be interviewed by the local media. And so the reporters would ask him, well, what are you doing in town? And what he wanted to say to them was, I'm here in town to be interviewed by you. <laughs> right? But he couldn't because it was all about appearances. So that kind of thing would go in the appearances section. So my suggestion is to report on appearances as just that mere appearances, which would be a way of jeering at them and labeling them as not quite real. So the appearances section of the Daily News would be heavy on satire and simple quotations. In the US, Jon Stewart has become a huge star by satirizing the world of appearances. And this would be a way to get in on some of that action. Appearances, then, is a way of downgrading or penalizing politicians who deal in the fake, the trivial, the merely sensational. In other words, you, the press would begin to say to people in politics, watch out or we'll put you in the appearances section. Under realities, we find everything that is actually about real problems, real solutions real proposals, consequential plans, and of course, events that deserve the title, events. This then is the political news proper, cured of what Tanner calls the sideshow. But then there's my other axis, arguments, facts, appearances, reality. Both are important, arguments and facts. Both are a valid part of politics. So, imagine these four quadrants. The bottom left, appearances presented as facts. For example, the media stunt would go there. Top left, phony arguments, manufactured controversies, sideshows, arguments that are really about not what's going on in the world, but about appearances. Bottom right, today's new realities. Get the facts, the actual news of politics. Top right, real arguments. Arguments that are based on something that's actually going on. Debates, legitimate controversies, important speeches. Now imagine all of today's political news and commentary sorted into these four quadrants. And then this becomes the new portal to political news, appearances and realities, arguments and facts. To render the political world that way, journalists would have to exercise their judgment about what is real and what is not. And this is exactly what would bring them into proper alignment with our needs as citizens.